Hi everyone, this is Off The Podium and I have a very, very special guest for me, uh, a mentor, a friend now, and I've studied with him for three years at the University of Washington, David Alexander Rabi, Director of Orchestral Studies at the University of Washington. David, welcome to Off The Podium. Thank you, Tigran. Really did happy I, to be here. Um, did I did I say the title right? You're you're director of orchestra orchestral studies, but you're also you know mentoring a lot of young conductors. Uh, what are some of your roles here at the University of Washington? Right. Well, I'm director of orchestral activities. I'm also teaching conducting together with Maestro Morlo, and we have a small but very intense conducting program. Yeah. And, and the great thing about pro, the program, especially for me as a conducting student, is that there's so, so, so many opportunities to conduct an orchestra. Right. Well, when you started, you didn't, there wasn't an orchestra for you. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to do is make sure there was a way for our conducting students to get podium time every mm -hmm. week. And so when I started here in 2013, there was only one orchestra. Yeah. And with a school with 40,000 students... I thought it was a little bit strange there was only one orchestra. Yeah. There are probably 10 orchestras walking around campus right now. <laughs> but, you know, just how how were we able to make it happen? Our symphony orchestra rehearsed at that time three times per week, mm -hmm. which is a big time commitment for a lot of students who would like to play but aren't going into music. So we started um, the Campus Philharmonia, which is – a once a week orchestra and it grew so much into two orchestras and so that's what our conducting students manage conduct and that's it's it's their it's their baby they yeah. can they can make it grow and that's their chance to conduct every week so it it fulfills two needs the podium time plus the students who want to play an orchestra who are too busy for a symphony have this opportunity to play once a week and yeah. play one concert per quarter yeah. So before you got to the University of Washington, you lived in Europe for a long time and also Canada. Some uh, memorable experiences from the many years in Europe, because I haven't really spent too much time in Europe. I moved to Vienna in 2001, and I only thought I thought I would only stay there for a year or maybe two. I was in the postgraduate at the Hochschule für Musik, and I didn't really like the school very much, but once I spent a few months there I realized wow I could learn a lot from being in this city mm -hmm. where most of the you know composers ended up at some point either passing by or living there or so I found um I found it to be the most inspiring place to learn about music I knew that I had I'd been missing something in my education I didn't know exactly what it was but going there and meeting people and being around musicians year after year, uh, getting to know people. And I realized that the classroom, the best place to learn music is not in the classroom. It's actually at the rehearsals. So I stopped going regularly to the school and started meeting real musicians yeah. and, you know, acting as if I belonged. Yeah. I'd walk into the, the Musikverein or the concert house and I'd go watch rehearsals. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't, I didn't care what the the dorm the the person at the door would stand there and just look at me walk in, but I wouldn't, you know, I, I didn't have my camera out. I didn't look like a tourist. Yeah. I had the score under my arm, and I just walked straight ahead. Yeah. Um, and so I just that that was where I learned most. Yeah, yeah. Coming back to the University of Washington, some of the most fulfilling reasons why you do this that job because you know as conductors sometimes growing up you you look at these great conductors uh, that inspire you as a young conductor and you want to be in that position you know conducting some professional orchestras well a lot of us end up conducting university groups and youth orchestras what what, what, what are some of the most fulfilling um, reasons you do this job well there's a lot to talk about there but i think the main part is that when you feel like you're making a difference in the experience that a student is having, then I think that's that's very fulfilling. I for me, it's not. It's definitely not fulfilling in, in itself just to stand in front of an orchestra and play a piece of music. It it doesn't it doesn't do enough for me to have, you know, even if it's a, a great orchestra that plays technically really well. Mm -hmm. If I'm not sure that I'm making a difference, then I don't, it's not really that interesting for yeah. me. 
I really enjoy the process of taking something that doesn't really like when we start out no one really knows the piece or what to do with it uh-huh. and then you work on it and then you you share the things that that you think make the piece come to life and you help them learn it and then in that process that's where the fulfillment happens yeah. Instead of just going to an orchestra that's already good, this is, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to seem like that's a negative thing. Yeah. You know, so because some people will say, "Oh, he doesn't like professionals because blah blah blah." It's not my, it's, it's not my area of interest to just go somewhere where something is already in shape. Yeah. Because I, I, I like to make a difference. I like to build things. Yeah. So it must be tough to work with a group that some of the orchestral music, some of the musicians in the orchestra are music majors and they get to spend a couple hours a day at least practicing. And you also have musicians who are non-majors and they might have, you know, half an hour a day or if that to practice. So, so how do you balance that, you know, inspiring people who are, you know, music majors and non-majors? It must be tough to balance that. Yeah, well, it's not an easy balance, but I feel like it's something that I can relate to because you know I want to make it I, I don't want to make it go too fast for those that are doing it vocationally yeah. but I also want the music students to get a real experience yeah. you know but I think what it really comes down to is how you treat people mm-hmm. because if you if you just get a bunch of people with the same goal you you have the the expectations that you have are that people are going to bring their best mm-hmm. you're going to You know, you want everyone to do the best they can. Yeah. And I don't judge people on the level that they're at. I just want them to do the best they can. And I know I know that from the years that I had my own group years ago I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that I had students from all these different schools doing different things. And you just – you have a goal. Yeah. And you, you're like, hey, let's do this. Let's do this. And everyone just does the best they yeah. can. And that, that's, that's, that's all you want, people yeah. to do the best they can. Yeah. And one thing that I, I've always found fascinating with you is the programming, programming for the season. Because I know you put a lot of work and thought into programming and making sure that the students have so many different experiences. And looking at the program, for those who are, are listening, uh, go to the University of Washington School of Music page, go to the orchestra page, and just look at the season's program. Because it, it has so many different things that are part of that program, from collaborations with professional musicians and side-by-side side and all these different things. What does it take? And I know it's a big question, but what does it take to really put together a program like that? Where do you, where do you even start with that? Uh, good question. When I got here to the university, I, I asked to see the programs that they had done for the past five or six years. And they were, they were good. You have to start out by looking to see what they've played already. Because the, the, thing, the thing is that the orchestra changes all the time. There's a lot of turnover. You know, the, the number of music students, while it's stabilizing a bit now in the last year or two, it's been fluctuating a lot. And then a lot of the non-majors are coming in and out because of their schedules. And that's to be understood. Um, so... I, I think it's important, you know, what, what is standard repertory, like the things you have to play, Beethoven symphonies, Brahms symphonies, the, all this stuff. And then there's all the different styles within classical music that I think are very important because the symphony orchestra is really one, it's a late 19th century instrument, and that's the thing that it, it does the best. But we need to play other things too. So I try to put some pillars through this throughout the season, you know, important things. I always try to do Beethoven and Brahms and important things and then and always try to have some some faculty soloists, mm-hmm. some outside soloists, try to get Maestro Morlo on the podium yeah. and also do smaller pieces which usually get marginalized by larger pieces yeah. on concerts. So, if, you know, a Mozart or a Haydn piece is almost never the focus of a concert yeah. in a, in the symphony orchestra setting. So sometimes we do that just to get a variety of styles out there. First you have to know what the styles are and then you have to sit down and design it in a way that somehow works. Yeah. And the easy way out would just be to have a rotation of repertoire and just do this and do yeah. that, but um you know, I, I try to get creative. There are a lot of things I would like to do personally yeah. that I don't think are the best choices for this setting. Yeah. So I don't do them. Whereas some 
other conductors may feel it's their right to say, well, I'm the conductor of this group and I want to do this piece, so I'm going to do this piece. Yeah. I never do that, really. I, I mean, I have to want to conduct it, yeah. but I'm trying to do things that I think the students should be yeah. experiencing. And, and the great thing is that I just recently saw that you premiered the work by a young composer from University of Washington. Right. You've premiered pieces by faculty composers and uh, you've also done collaborations with the jazz faculty. So, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that the university orchestra does, which is all really really great. It almost seems like a regional professional orchestra when you look at the when you look at the five or six concert season. Right? How many how many concerts? Is yeah. Season? Well, we're on the quarter system here, so I try to have two concert cycles per quarter. So that'll be six yeah. concerts. Occasionally, one of the cycles gets split into two. Um, but so it's six or seven yeah. concerts, which for the type of orchestra it is, it's a, it's a lot. But, you know, it, you don't get anything out of things if you don't push a little bit, yeah. you know. And, and it's sometimes people are like, oh, this is too much. But then by the time the concert comes, they realize that it was a good experience. Yeah. And that's the whole point. Yeah. So. And I, and I see the, the Haydn experience, uh, part for the Haydn experience. Did that already happen? No, it's coming up on the 27th. Do you yeah. want to share some thoughts or about, about the Haydn experience concert that's coming up? Yeah, well, Haydn is a composer that, that everyone's heard of, uh -huh. and certainly all musicians know Haydn. But how many pieces by Haydn does the average musician really know? Um, I can say the same thing about Mozart, too. I mean, yeah. 600 some odd pieces by Mozart and the average musician knows maybe 15 to 20 of them yeah. to be generous. And why are these gigantic great composers who wrote so much music just relegated to the, their names, yeah. you know? Yeah. And on symphony orchestra programs, Haydn is usually the warm-up piece. It usually doesn't get rehearsed because Shostakovich or Mahler or Britten or whatever it is gets its Get, gets all the rehearsal yeah. time. And you know what? It should, because it's technically, from a late 19th century viewpoint, yeah. it's technically more difficult. But reading the notation mm. is a completely different thing. So what happens usually, and of course people may take this as an insult, and I don't mean it that way, but usually when people play Haydn, they're just reading what they see on the page as if they were reading something by Stravinsky. Yeah. And so I, I put together this, this what I call the Haydn experience based on something that I saw Simon Rattle do. He created an imaginary symphony, as he called it, yeah. by Haydn. And so he took a bunch of different Haydn movements and performed them all together. And I liked the idea a lot, and I thought that we should do something similar. And so I created my own pastiche of Haydn movements, which are not only from symphonies, they're from uh, oratorios, there's an overture, there's a recitative, there's a vocal canon, and it's designed to give the performers and the audience a, a deeper appreciation for the genius of Haydn, and also to show off what our orchestra can do, because there are a bunch of movements with solos that, or that feature different parts of the orchestra, and I think it's just in this in the university setting. It's a very educational experience for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. So the Haydn experience, which leads me to a newer project, which I know it's still new, it's still in the works. But if you don't mind sharing a little bit about what's to come for Seattle and just the the, the world, I guess. Well, we're working <laughs> <laughs> working on a new ensemble in the area, uh, which we would like to call the Haydn Mozart Project, mm -hmm. and. I decided to start this because in in the area we have many we have the we have the professional orchestras we have the community orchestras we have baroque orchestra yeah. we have university orchestra and if you look at the programming again like I just mentioned a little earlier Mozart and Haydn who are two you know giants their music is almost never featured as the main part of a program. And it can't be. It can't be the main focus of a symphony orchestra program because it's not late 19th century music. It's also not Baroque music. So when the Baroque ensembles venture forward and yeah. play you know, Mozart or into Schubert, they do it from time to time, but it isn't their main mission. So there is a gap yeah. And I'm trying to fill that gap with a period instrument ensemble 
that focuses on classical period, which is Haydn, Mozart, and, and other composers as well, so that we can take a lens to that music and make it come to life yeah. and to focus on yeah. it and not just play the notes that are on the page. Looking at that time period, and especially with everything that's going on with, you know, L.A. Phil, for example, has, you know, a, a great season program where they're featuring a lot of diverse, you know, composers from diverse backgrounds. Does that time period have a, a lot of diversity, especially in Europe, you know, you know the Mozart-Haydn time period, maybe? Yeah, well, there, there are always a lot of, as they say, Kleinmeister yeah. composers um, that disappeared they dropped out of fashion yeah. um, and many many of them just weren't as good yeah. but there are composers that were good there I've, I've discovered several including uh, Mariana Martinez who was born in Vienna and died in Vienna of Spanish background uh -huh. but she she was quite a significant composer in in that time and we Hopefully, we'll be performing. I don't, there'll probably be premieres, but yeah. at least in the Pacific Northwest, and that's one of my goals as well: is yeah. to is to play some of that music. Going back a little bit uh, to Vienna and Europe, and some of your teachers, uh, all of us have inspirational figures. And for me, you're you're obviously one of the people that really oh. inspired me to be a conductor, and really, I learned I've learned a lot from you over the past uh, years. But uh, for you, who are some influential teachers? Well, the most influential is probably Nicholas Harnoncourt over the last 15 years. Now, before that, there were some others. Um, but when I met him in 2003, it changed just about everything about how I function as a musician. It's, before, I, before I met him, I thought he was an eccentric, crazy person who just did everything differently and uh, but when I started listening to the reasons behind why that he was making the decisions he made then I started to question some of the things that I learned mm -hmm. and you know when we learn music when we're young we're taught that it's you know it's a universal language mm -hmm. and that we here's the notation and here's a quarter note and here's an eighth note and here's a rest and here you know and then you you have a metronome and then you count and you play um but where is the point that you realize that you're doing more than just executing notation and there will be people that say that they read music and have an imagination but you have to know the language first in order to express yourself mm -hmm. in it. The notation has, over the last, I don't know, a thousand years of music notation, it, it's always been changing. And the way people write changes. I like to compare it to, like, I don't know, we can say Shakespeare. Yeah. If, you, if you take some, some English by Shakespeare uh -huh. and you read it in modern with the modern eye, with the modern understanding of English, yeah. and you pronounce every single syllable the way, the way you're supposed to, yeah. and you say it with a beauty, beauty and tone, and you deliver it, what's it really saying? Yeah. I find that the same thing is happening when people yeah. play Bach or play Haydn, because it's not just about executing what's there. And yes, music is the... The language, it's, it's the, what's the word? It's the eternal language. Yeah. It's the language, everyone, universal, universal language. Everybody understands music, of course. But if you don't know the syntax, you don't really know what's yeah. being said. And that's, that's the problem. Like the understanding of base, the basic understanding of Western classical music syntax mm. is not the same as the universal language that's of true. someone just singing. Yeah. It's a very specific type of language. Yeah. And syntax and the way that it, it goes from one point to another in time. Yeah. And if that specific thing is not learned by someone, it's more difficult for them to grasp. I mean, with the universal language, you could say, oh, I like this part of this piece by so-and-so. Or I like this part or this part speaks to me. And this part. But to understand the language, you have to, you have to know what that, what that syntax is. And that, that's Western harmony. Yeah. And if... And Western harmony is not taught in schools anymore. Yeah. I'm talking about basic. I'm not talking about like teaching kids, 
intricacies of music theory. I'm just talking about like what a chord is, yeah. that it's what a triad is, and how you can have two two tri- triads in a row or something yeah. like that, because that's where the expression comes from. Yeah. It starts with that seed. If you know, back um, around the time of the election last year, I pulled out my copy of the Constitution because I felt like I needed to read it again. And as I was reading it, I thought, you know, this it's English, but it's 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 a different kind of English yeah. that we than we write today. Yeah. So am I supposed to understand this based on my knowledge of English yeah. now? Or do I have to really figure out what these words mean? Yeah. And there are people still today that don't understand what the words mean yeah. because they're reading it in the modern way. And I refuse to play music like that. I just don't think you can. I mean it, music used to be a dialogue. When did it become a monologue where one person uses it to just, you know, th- to fulfill their own, what they think of everything? You're supposed to put your stamp on it, but you have to understand it first. Yeah. So how, how do we make music relevant for today? You mean classical Class- music, music? So-called yes, classical yes, music? Yes. Well, it's like I was talking about the language. First, people have to understand something about how that language is making like subject and verb i find that when we when we say that classical music is somehow like its own thing but at the same time say that music is a universal language there's a there's a gap in there so i don't want to make music uh i don't want to make the recreation of this older music like a museum because it has to be relevant for today well how do you make it relevant for today well some people decide that that they will dress it up so that it looks like it's relevant. Like um, you'll, you can call it something else. Yeah. Call it this. Put a jazz combo on the front of your symphony orchestra yeah. brochure. Put uh, and that, that's not a knock to jazz because yeah. jazz is great. Yeah. But you, but it isn't the same thing. Yeah. So you either talk about jazz or you talk about this or that. I mean, they're yeah. they're, they're they're just different. Yeah. So you know you could. Would, if you go to a museum, you're you're not, you don't go up to the the person running the museum and say, "I don't like this painting. Why is it on the wall?" It's there because someone knows it's important. Yeah. So when we program classical concerts, we're doing it because we know that the piece is important and that sh- people should want to listen to it. There was a point in history where people wanted to hear new music and only new music and not older music, and then it changed. And now the audience. Generally, audiences want to hear things they already know, yeah. but that's the world we live in. Yeah. And so, okay, well, people, they already know this. They don't want to hear something new. What, what do you, how can you do? Well, that's just the world we live in. The music will come to life if you learn how to realize the notation based on how the composer was thinking. Like what a dotted half note is not the same thing in Bach as it is in yeah. Stravinsky. Yeah. And then it will come to life. But also the audience has to know what they're, how to perceive those things and not just, well, we're going to play something from many years ago and you're supposed to like it. It's, it's, it's a tough world we live in because there's so many people have so many things going on in their life and they have, they have so many different types of music coming at them from different directions, whether, whether they're at a store or yeah. <clears throat> somewhere else. And it's, and it's really tough. So, so classical music sometimes, you know, going back to the, you know, the uh, classical music and the how relevant it is, uh, it, 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 it's so tough. It almost seems like a foreign language, even if we're even if we're talking right. about it. So, well, that's the thing. Like, if you go if you go to Budapest and listen to someone giving a, a, a lecture in Hungarian yeah. and you don't know the language, yeah. it sounds really cool, but you don't know what they're talking yeah. about. Yeah. And that's exactly what's happening at concerts. Yeah. And dare I say it, even musicians themselves when they play because they're reading the notes of course they're playing musically but it becomes an execution of what's on the page and not an expression of a language i don't know if this is related but the the word note i mean in german it's the same word note but it's also a word for danger Mm. or something important or something like like uh i don't know urgent Mm -hmm. Note file. So it's like there. I think there's a connection because you know how do you express something in language? You have to write it down, yeah. right? So you write it down, and that's like an it's like an emergency notation yeah. for something you want to express. Yeah. 
and then it's just relegated to eighth note, quarter note, rest, you know, this rest, that rest. All the discipline that we learn about when we're young to read notation actually has seeped into us, into our musical understanding, which I, I'm trying to break wherever I can. Yeah. So it's just, it's really important to, to consider that it is a language and that has evolved over time and, and it has to be looked at from the point of view, from that point of view going forward and not from our point of view going backwards. Because yeah. it's not the composer's fault that we can't read their language. Yeah. Yeah. It's our fault. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, something I always talk about, I always bring up, but, you know, I mean, what can we do as musicians to, to excite our audiences a little bit more? Because, you know, I go to these fantastic concerts in Seattle, in the Seattle area, and, and I see, you know, young, young musicians bringing exciting new music maybe sometimes, and, and, and the audiences, there's it's not much of an audience for it. I mean, what, what, are we doing something wrong? Are are is, is the music education? I know this is a big question, but is, is what's lacking in this whole system for for us not to have more 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 audiences in the halls? Well, I don't, I can't fix it with one answer, but I I really think it comes down to if you're talking about Western classical music, is the basic is is, is the the education and the teaching of the basic grammar of western classical music which is it, i mean it's really harmony that's that's where it comes from and if young people don't learn it now if young people don't learn about that then they won't have a chance to 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 dive into that only the ones that have a natural music musical instinct will be able to latch on to some things they hear now and then and there's nothing wrong with any of that people should no one's the same not everyone is going to have the same musical talent or aptitude or interest but there are plenty of people out there who can perceive it and could perceive it if they were exposed to it and exposure doesn't necessarily mean just playing an instrument i mean that's part of it but it's understanding the language now we start learning to speak our native language not not by studying the grammar of yeah. it, but we're speaking it all the time. It's being spoken to us. That's the primary means of communication, so that's how we learn it. If, if that's what music was, yeah. everyone would be a musician. Well, that's what music is. So, but but it's it's all kinds of different types of music, not just right. Western classical music. Because, right. like I said, there's just so much so much music coming in all the d different directions. But th only probably zero point one percent of it is classical music for for the a average average person in the in, in this country. Right. So it's 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 so tough. But you know, it, it's great that uh, you know, for example, University of Washington. There's extra, you know, a couple of other orchestras uh, at the University of Washington. Yeah. And, and so it gives people more exposure and more concerts to attend, uh, to participate more actively. So, so those, those are all great things. I, I wanted to ask you about advice to young musicians. With all these experiences that you've had, what, what's, what's your advice to young musicians trying to make it? And you know how tough it is, you know, trying to get jobs and trying to even get into college for a, a program. It's, it, it's so tough out there. What's your advice to you young mean musicians? young musicians in general? Yes. Well, you know, you ask yourself why you're doing what what you're doing why you like it and see if there's a way that you can get that as your main activity if you really enjoy it and it doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to become a soloist on your instrument or get a job in an orchestra there are really a lot of possibilities out there to make music to have music be part of your life but to, you know, to, to ask yourself how important it is to you, that's really, I mean, it, it's essential to know that for yourself. Yeah. You may not be able to answer it the first time you ask yourself. Yeah. You know, I knew I wanted to do music, but I wasn't really sure what it was going to be, yeah. how it was going to play out. And also that if music is important to you, but you want to do something else, you don't have to give it up. Yeah. And you probably shouldn't give it up unless you absolutely have to. Yeah. Another important project that you're involved with is the Daniels book. Right. And why don't you 
talk about a little bit about your role and, and maybe the start of how it all came together for you to be involved with that project because it's quite unusual. Yeah, well, this Daniel's orchestral music is a, I guess you'd call it a compendium, mm -hmm. um, which is, it's, which has a listing of, quote, all orchestral pieces um, with their instrumentation, like specific instrumentation. Yeah movements, durations of the movements, um, publisher, date of composition or revision, um, and just anything you need to program a piece of music uh, that would that's, that's conducted. Yeah. And that's why it's useful for conductors, but also administrators and orchestral librarians. It's not just a catalog, yeah. because a catalog, you could go to a publisher and look at their catalog, yeah. but... What's unique about this book is David Daniels, who founded it in 1972, the first edition, made it necessary. He made it a, a stipulation that you every piece that gets put in that book, the score has been examined page by page yeah. to make sure that the info is right. So is it three flutes and the third doubles piccolo yeah. or is the or is is, you know, or is it can you play it with three players or does it really need? You know, yeah. it, it's like, or how many percussionists you need for a piece? Just because catalogs aren't always right. When you open up a score, the first page isn't always yeah, right. Sure. So th when I started using the book, oh, 20 years ago or so, uh, I found things in it that I thought needed a little bit of shaping up because I found some mistakes here and there. And so I contacted the author, and after numerous exchanges, we started to develop. A, a working relationship where I would I would give him all kinds of information for this book because it's really important. Yeah. I found the book is really useful, and here we are twenty years later, and I'm the co-author of the sixth edition, yeah. which will come out in two thousand twenty-two. Wow, how many and uh, how many what's uh, how many entries? Well, where we just passed uh, the ten thousand mark, wow. so there are ten ten thousand. Uh, entries in this database. It's also online at Daniel's Orchestral Music Online, which you can subscribe to and use there. I find it useful to have the book and the online database. I'm not just trying to sell it that way, but <laughs> it's useful to have both when you're programming, when you're looking things up. Yeah. Um, it's a resource that just about all orchestral musicians or conductors, I shouldn't say the musicians because they don't really need to use this yeah. book, but the conductors and people involved in programming yeah. orchestra concerts use this book daily. Yeah. So what, uh, you know, as, as a musician, I know you're super busy. Uh, what do you do that's not related to music? Um, well, music really is my life, and I have, to, I, I have to dedicate my life to what I'm doing, otherwise it won't it won't it'll just be mediocre yeah my work won't be at the level it needs to be if i were a genius it might be different but it, <laughs> i have to put i have to put a lot of effort and time into making things happen yeah. so there isn't much time for other things at this point thanks david anything else you want to say well one of the things that harnacore used to talk about from time to time in rehearsal was that security and beauty are not compatible mm. and the more I think about that, it affects everything I do. Yeah. If a conductor says, this has to be together, this has to be together, you know, and that's the goal, make it together. If it's not together, it's got to be together. Like, or at least you start with it being together. Yeah. It actually ends up becoming the goal for people because how do you judge something if it's good or not? Well, if it's not together, it's not good. But the best things could happen right when they're almost not together. And it's not, that's not to say that I go in saying, hey, everyone, let's not play together. But I don't make it the goal. And I, don't, and I think that when you're a conductor and, you, and you're doing a lot of this music where the notation doesn't always tell you what's happening, if you, if you take everything so literally and if you try to make things together, you're missing the point. Yeah. And if I want to make like a, a line of 16th notes more beautiful, how do I do that? Yeah. 
Well, I think about how I want it to shape, and some notes are longer than others, and sometimes the tempo pushes, and sometimes it pulls back. Yeah. But those those are all things that if you listen to performances from like the 50s, 60s, 70s, that recording, the, the whole recording industry has, has, has kind of stomped out the this kind of beauty mm-hmm. and replaced it with security. Actually... I can also say that the evolution of instruments has also played a part in that too because you want to have something better, it's more secure. Yeah. Like the modern wind instruments are much more secure. Yeah. The modern brass players are much more secure. We don't play the earlier Haydn symphonies anymore, many of them, because the horn parts are too high because yeah. they're natural horns. And there's a security issue there because if someone is going to crack notes, then they don't want to do it. Yeah. Whereas... You're supposed to take that risk. Yeah. The way things are set up in our world today, security has su- superseded beauty in a lot of ways. And I don't know when when I play when I play um, music, especially before the time of Brahms, I'm really trying to tear away the the security. Yeah. Thanks, David. Thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure. It's it's been great talking to you. It's been a while since you've been in here. So yeah, and <laughs> and, and hopefully when you do get your orchestra started here, we'll we'll come back and 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 do podcast number two for this. I'd love to talk more about that once we're off the ground. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.